Hello everybody and welcome to another podcast of Bookers. This is Amen and I'm very happy to be with you and learn English together. Thank you so much and let's go for chapter 7. By the way, the answer of previous question. Could you guess? I should say that the answer is nothing because the house is one story house. There is nothing. There is no stairs. So, let's go for chapter 7 and another surprising question at the end of it. Let's go. It was a bitter winter. The stormy weather was followed by a sleet and snow and then by hard frost which didn't break till well into February. The animals carried on as best they could with their building of the windmill, well knowing that the outside world was watching them and that there were envious human beings who would reduce and triumph if the mill were not finished on time. Out of spite, the human beings pretended not to believe that it was a snowball who had destroyed the windmill. They said that it had fallen down because the walls were too thin. The animals know that this wasn't the case. Still, it had been decided to build the walls 3 feet weak this time instead of 18 inches as before, which meant collecting much larger quantities of stone. For a long, the quarry was full of snow drifts and nothing could be done. Some progress was made in the dry frosty V, other that followed, but it was cruel work, and the animals couldn't feel so hopeful about it as they had felt before. They were always cold, and usually hungry as well. Only Boxer and Clover never lost heart. A squealer made excellent speeches on the joy of service and the dignity of labor, but the other animals found more inspiration in Boxer's strange and his never-failing cry of I will work harder. In January, food fell short. The core ration was drastically reduced and it was announced that an extra potato ration would be issued to make up for it. Then it was discovered that the greater part of the potato crop had been frosted in the clamps which hadn't been covered thickly enough. The potatoes had become soft and discolored, and only a few were edible. For days at a time, the animals had nothing to eat, but chef and mangless starvation seemed to stare them in the face. It was vitally necessary to conceal this fact from the outside world. Emboldened by the collapse of the windmill, the human beings were inventing fresh lies about animal farm. Once again it was being put about that all the animals were dying of famine and disease, and that they were continually fighting among themselves and had resorted to cannibalism and infanticide. Napoleon was well aware of the bad results that might follow if the real facts of the food situation were known, and he decided to make use of Mr. Wimper to spread a concentrary impression. The animals had little or no contact with Wimper on his weekly visits. Now, however, a few selected animals, mostly sheep, were instructed to remark casually in his hearing that rations had been increased. In addition, Napoleon ordered the almost empty beans in the store shed to be filled nearly to the brim with the stand, which was then covered up with what remained of the grain and meal. On some suitable pretext, Wimper was led through the store's hand and allowed to catch a glimpse of the beans. He was deceived and continued to report to the outside world that there was no food shortage on animal farm. Nevertheless, towards the end of January, it became obvious that it would be necessary to procure some more grain from somewhere. 
In these days, Napoleon rarely appeared in public, but spent all his time in the farmhouse, which was guarded at, at each door by fierce-looking dogs. When he did emerge, it was in a ceremont, ceremonial manner, with an escort of six dogs who closely surrounded him and growled if anyone came too near. Frequently, he didn't even appear on Sunday mornings, but issued his orders through one of the other pigs, usually a squealer. One Sunday morning, a squealer announced that the hens who had just come in to lay game must surrender their the eggs. Napoleon had accepted through Wimper a contract for 400 eggs a week. The price of this would pay for enough grain and meal to keep the farm going till summer came and conditions were easier. When the hands heard this, they raised a terrible outcry. They had been warned earlier that this sacrifice might be necessary, but hadn't believed that it would really happen. They were just getting their cloches ready for the spring sitting, and they protested that to take the eggs away now was murder. For the first time since the explosion of Jones, there was something resembling a rebellion, led by three young black Minorca pullets. The hands made a determined effort to fraud Napoleon's wishes. Their method was to fly up to the rafters and there lay their eggs, which smashed to pieces on the floor. Napoleon acted swiftly and ruthlessly. He ordered the hens' rations to be stopped and decreed that any animal giving so much as a grain of corn to a hen should be punished by death. The dogs saw to it that these orders were carried out. For five days the hens held out. Then they capitulated and went back to their nesting boxes. Nine hens had died in the meantime. Their bodies were buried in the orchard, and it was given out that they had died of Cassidius. Wimper heard nothing of this affair, and the eggs were duly delivered. A grocer's van driving up to the farm once a week to take them away. All this while, no more had been seen of Snowball. He was rewarded to be hiding on one of the neighboring farms, either Foxwood or Pinchfield. Napoleon was by this time on slightly better terms with the other farmers than before. It happened that there was in the yard a pile of timber which had been stacked there ten years earlier when a beech spiny was cleared. It was well seasoned and whimper and advised Napoleon to sell it. Both Mr. Plington and Mr. Frederick were anxious to buy it. Napoleon was hesitating between the two, unable to make up his mind. It was noticed that whenever he seemed on the point of coming to an agreement with Frederick, the snowball was declared to be in hiding at Foxwood. While when he inclined toward Pellington, the snowball was said to be at Pinchfield. Suddenly, early in the spring, an alarming thing was discovered. A snowball was secretly frequenting the farm by night. The animals were so disturbed that they could hardly sleep in their stalls. Every night, it was said, he came, creeping in under cover of darkness, and performed all kinds of mischief. He stole the corn, he upset the meek pails, he broke the eggs, he trampled the seed beds, he gnawed the bark of the fruit trees. Whenever anything went wrong, it became usual to attribute it to snowball. If a window was broken or a drain was blocked up, Someone was certain to say that the snowball had come in the night and done it, and when the key of the store shed was lost, the whole farm was convinced that the snowball had thrown it down the well. Curiously enough, they went on believing this even after the 
mislaid key was found under a sack of meal. The cause declared unanimously that the snowball crept into their stalls and milked them in their sleep. The rats, which had been troublesome that winter, were also said to be in league with snowball. Apollon decreed that there should be a full investigation into a snowball's activities. With his dogs in attendance, he set out and made a careful tour of inspection of the farm buildings, the other animals following at a respectful distance. At every full step, Apollon stopped and snuffed the ground for traces of Snowball's footsteps, which he said he could detect by the smell. He snuffed in every corner, in the bar, in the co-shed, in the hen house, in the vegetable garden, and found traces of a snowball almost everywhere. He would put his snout to the gerund, give several deep sniffs, and exclaim in a terrible voice, The snowball! He has been there. I can smell him distinctly. And at the board, the snowball, all the dogs let out blood curdling groans and showed their side teeth. The animals were truly frightened. It seemed to them as though snowball were some kind of invisible influence, providing the air about them and menacing them with all kinds of dangers. In the evening, a squealer called them together and with an alarmed expression on his face, told them that he had some serious news to report. Hey you camels, cried the squealer, making leader nervous skips. A most terrible thing has been discovered. A snowball has sold himself to Frederick of Pinchfield Farm, who is even now plotting to attack us and take our farm away from us. A snowball is to act as his guide when the attack begins, but there is worse than that. We had thought that the snowball's rebellion was caused simply by his vanity and ambition, but we were wrong, comrades. Do you know what the real reason was? A snowball was in league with Jones from the very start. He was Jones' secret again agent all the time. It has all been proved by documents which he left behind him and which we have only just discovered. To my mind, this explains a great deal, Kemert. Did we not see for ourselves how he attempted, fortunately without success, to get us defend and destroyed at the Battle of the Koshet? The animals were stupefied. This was a weakness for outdoing a snowball's destruction of the windmill. But it was some minutes before they could fully take it in. They all remembered or thought they remembered how they had seen a snowball charging ahead of them at the Battle of the Koshet. Now he had railed and encouraged them at every turn, and how he had not paused for an instant even when the pellets from Jones gone had wounded his back. At first, it was a little difficult to see how this fitted in with his being on Jones. Even Boxer, who seldom asked questions, was puzzled. He lay down, tucked his four hoofs beneath him, shut his eyes, and with a hard effort managed to formulate his thoughts. I don't believe that, he said. A snowball fought bravely at the Battle of the Koshet. I saw him myself. I saw him. Did we not give him Animal Hero first class immediately afterwards? That was our mistake, Kemert. For we now know it's all written down in the secret documents that we have found that in reality he was trying to lure us to our doom. But he was wounded, said Boxer. We all saw him running with blood. That was part of the arrangement, cried the squealer. John's shot only grazed him. I could show you this in his own writing, if you were able to read it. The plot was for a snowball, at the critical moment, to give the signal for flight and leave the field to the enemy. 
and he very nearly succeed. I will even say Kemers, he would have succeed if it hadn't been for our heroic leader, Kemert Napoleon. Do you not remember now? Just at the moment when Jones and his men had got inside the yard, a snowball suddenly turned and filled, and many animals followed him. And do you not remember too that it was just at that moment when panic was spreading and all seemed lost, that Kemmer Napoleon sprang forward with a cry of death to humanity and sank his teeth in Jones' leg? Surely you remember that Kemmer exclaimed the squealer, frisking from side to side. Now, when a squealer described the scene, no graphically, it seemed to be animals that they did remember it. At any rate, they remembered that at, at the critical moment of the battle, Snowball had turned to flee. But Boxer was still a little uneasy. I don't believe that the Snowball was a traitor to the beginning. He said finally, that he has done seem indifferent, but I believe that at the battle of the Koshed he was a good Kemert. Our leader Kemert Napoleon announced the squealer speaking very slowly and firmly, as stated categorically, categorically Kemert that the snowball was Jones' agent from the very beginning, yes, and from long before the leveling was over fought off. Uh, that's different, said Boxer. If Kemmer Napoleon says it, it must be right. That's the true spirit, Kemmer, cried the squealer, but it was noticed he cast a very ugly look at Boxer with his little twinkling eyes. He turned to go, then paused and added impressively, I warn every animal on his farm to keep his eyes very wide open. For we have reasons to think that some of the snowball secret agents are lurking among us at the moment. Four days later, in the late afternoon, Napoleon ordered all the animals to assemble in the yard. When they were all gathered together, Napoleon emerged from the farmhouse, wearing both his medals, for he had recently awarded himself Animal Hero 1st Class and Animal Hero 2nd Class. With his nine huge dogs frisking round him and uttering growls that sent shivers down all the animals' spines, they are covered silently in their places, seeming to know in advance that some terrible things was about to happen. Plon stood sternly surviving his audience, then he uttered a high-pitched whimper. Immediately the dogs bounded forward, seized four of the pigs by the ear and dragged them, squealing with pain and terror, to Napoleon's feet. The pigs' ears were bleeding, the dogs had tasted blood, and for a few moments they appeared to go quite mad. To the amazement of everybody, three of them flung themselves upon a boxer. Boxer saw them coming and put out his great hoof caught a dog in mid -air and pinned him to, it, to the gerund. The dog shrieked for mercy and the other two fled with their tails between their legs. Boxel looked at Napoleon to know whether he should crush the dog to death or let it go. Napoleon appeared to change countenance and sharply ordered Boxer to let the dog go. Varit Boxer lifted his hoof and the dog slung away, bruised and howling. Presently, the tumult died down. The four pigs waited, trembling with glut, written on every line of their countenances. Napoleon now called upon them to confess their crimes. They were the same four pigs as had protested when Napoleon abolished the Sunday meeting. Without any further prompting, they confessed that they had been secretly in touch with Snowball ever since his explosion. They had collaborated with him in destroying the windmill, 
and that they had entered into an agreement with him to hand over Animal Farm to Mr. Frederick. They added that Snowball had privately admitted to them that he had been Jones' secret agent for years past. When they had finished their confession, the dogs promptly tore their throat out and in a terrible voice Napoleon demanded whether any other animal had anything to confess. The free hands who had been the ringleaders in the attempt rebellion over the eggs now came forward and stated that the snowball had appeared to them in a dream and incited them to disobey Napoleon's order. They too were slaughtered. Then a goose came forward and confessed to having secreted six ears of corn during the last year's harvest and eaten them in the night. Then a sheep confessed to having an arenated in the drinking pool or agreed to do this. So she said by a snowball and two other sheep confessed to having murdered an old tramp and specially devoted follower of Napoleon by chasing him round and round a bonfire when he was suffering from a cough. They were all slain on the spot, and so the tale of confession and executions went out, until there was a pile of corpses lying before Apollon's feet, and the air was heavy with the smell of blood, which had been unknown there since the explosion of Jones. When it was all over, the remaining animals, except for the pigs and dogs, crept away in a body. They were shaken and miserable. They didn't know which was more shocking. The treachery of the animals who had legged themselves with the snowball or the cruel retribution they had just witnessed. In the old days there had often been scenes of bloodshed, equally terrible, but it seemed to all of them that it was far worse now that it was happening among themselves. Since Jones had left the farm until today, no animal had killed another animal. Not even a rat had been killed. They had made their way onto the little knoll where the half-finished windmill stood, and with one accord they all lay down as foe-holdingly together for Warf, Clover, Murel, Benjamin. They caused the sheep and a wolf like of geese and hens. Everyone, indeed, except the cat, who had suddenly disappeared just before Napoleon ordered the animals to assemble. For some time nobody spoke, only Boxer remained on his feet. He fidgeted to and through, sweeping his long black tail against his sides and occasionally uttering a little whinny of surprise. Finally, he said, I don't understand it. I wouldn't have believed that the such things could happen on our farm. It must be due to some fault in ourselves. The solution, as I see it, it's work harder. From now onwards, I shall get up a full hour earlier in the mornings. And he moved off at his lumbering trot and made for the quarry. Having got there, he collected two successive loads of stone and dragged them down to the windmill before retiring for the night. The animals huddled about Clover, not speaking. The knoll there were. A line gave them a wide prospect across the countryside. Most of Animal Farm was within their view. The line passed there, stretching down to the main road. The high field, the spinny, the drinking pool, the prophet fields where the young wet was thick and green, and the red roofs of the farm buildings with the smoke curling from the chimneys. It was a clear spring evening. The grass and the bursting hedges were gilded by the level rays of the sun. Never had the farm, and with a kind of surprise, they remembered that it was their own farm, every inch of it, their own property, a to the animals 
so desirable a place. As Clover looked down the hillside, her eyes filled with tears. If she could have spoken her thoughts, it would give in to say that this wasn't what they had aimed at when they had set themselves years ago to work for the overthrow of the human race. This sense of terror and slaughter were not what they had looked forward to on that night when old Major first steered them to rebellion. If she herself had any picture of the future, it had been of a society of animals set free from hunger and the weep, all equal, each working according to his capacity. The strong protesting, the weak as she had protected the last brood of ducklings with her foreleg on the night of Major's speech. Instead, she didn't know why. They had come to a time when no one dared speak his mind, when fierce growling dogs roamed everywhere, and when you had to watch your cameras torn to pieces after confessing to shocking crimes, there was no thought of rebellion or disobedience in her mind. She knew that, even as things were, they were far better off than they had been in the days of Jones, and that, before all else, it was needful to prevent the return of the human beings. Whatever happened, she would remain faithful, work hard, carry out the orders that were given to her, and accept the leadership of not alone. But still, it wasn't for this that she and all the other animals had hoped and toiled. It was not for this that they had built the windmill and faced the bullets of John's gun. Such were her thoughts, thought she lacked the words to express them. At least, feeling this to be in some way a substitute for the word she was unable to find, she began to sing Beasts of England. The other animals sitting round her took it up and they sang it three times over, very tunefully, but slowly and mournfully, in a way they had never sung it before. They had just finished singing it for the third time, when a squealer attended by two dogs, approached them with the air of having something important to say. He announced that by a special decree of Kermit Napoleon, beasts of England had been abolished, from now onwards, it was forbidden to sing it. The animals were taken aback. Why? cried Murel. It's no longer needed, Kemert, said the squealer Stiffy. Beasts of England was the song of the rebellion, but the rebellion is now completed. The execution of the traitors this afternoon was the final act. The enemy, both external and internal, has been defeated. In Beasts of England, we expressed our lunging for a better society in days at to come. But that society has now been established. Clearly, this song has no longer any purpose. Frightened thought they were. Some of the animals might possibly have protested, but at this moment, the sheep set up their usual bleating of four legs good and two legs bad which went on for several minutes and put an end to the discussion. So, Beasts of England was here no more. In its place, Minims, the poet had composed another song which began, Animal far, animal far, never through me shall to come to harm. This was sung every Sunday morning after the hosting of the flag, but somehow either the words nor the two never seemed to the animals to come up to beasts of England. In the end of chapter 7. Thank you so much for your listening. And it's the time of our final question. The question is, what's at the end of the rainbow? What's at the end of the rainbow? Please guess your answers and write them on the comment box and tomorrow at the beginning of the new podcast i will tell the true answer
Thank you so much. Please like and subscribe my channel. And goodbye until the another podcast. Thank you so much and goodbye.